good. While we're all um, standing on our feet, or three of us are standing on our feet, <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you so much for this time together. It's a special time. And you say in your word, Lord God, where two or more gather in your name, there you are, right in the midst of us. So it's almost as if you're walking between the aisles, Lord God, that your hand is upon us. Thank you that you are a God that does not judge and that does not condemn. You're a God that lifts us up, Lord. You're the God that sees every need, whether we consider it to be small or large. You see every detail in our life, the struggles, the turmoil, the stress, all the times where we worried, where no one knew that we were worrying. You were there with us, Lord God. So help us to acknowledge your presence and help us to know that we're never alone. And as we delve into your word this morning, let it enrich us, Lord God. Help us to be open to your word and open to your Holy Spirit so that we can leave bigger and better people, Lord God, because of it. Enabled and empowered to help people around us in this world. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So good. Take a seat. Take a seat. Fantastic. Well, just at the last minute, my iPad decided to fail. That's fine. So I've lost all my notes, which is great because I've got a few other notes um, here on my phone. But um, I mean, I'm kind of like squinting. I'm already squinting because I'm Asian. That's not why I'm squinting. <laughs> I'm squinting because I'm looking at very tiny words on this phone. But who needs uh, notes when you've got the Holy Spirit, right? And every person hates to hear a preacher say that because they're like, oh, no, here we go. This guy's going to go for an hour. But no, I'll only go for about 30 minutes at the most. So please bear with us. But um, today is a, a wonderful celebration, and that is NADOC week. So it is the end of NADOC week. So it started on the 2nd of July, and it ends on the 9th of July, which is today. And so we just thought we'd... Uh, join the rest of the country in celebrating something that is very important, uh, which is the First Nation people. And um, we, we don't celebrate First Nation people because they were here first. We celebrate First Nation people because they are family. They are our family. I discovered that more than ever before when I realised that the person that I was marrying is in fact a Wiradjuri girl, an Indigenous girl. And learning about the culture, the Indigenous culture, it is fascinating, it is so cool to know that we share land with people of brilliance, with people of great integrity, of people that are very spiritual, people that are very sensitive to what God is doing. And a cohort of communities that are coming to Christ radically. And so we need to honour and we need to acknowledge, not because we have to, but because we want to value family, which is really cool. So. I just wanted to say that we as a church, we acknowledge the, uh, the Yagara and also the Turrbal people, the Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander, the owners of the land where we gather today and pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. We recognise their connection to country and their role in caring for and maintaining country over thousands of years. What is the purpose of NADOC? The purpose of NADOC is in fact celebrating the history, culture and achievements of our Indigenous people. So we're going to play a video about NADOC and the theme this year for NADOC is in fact for our elders, for our elders and we'll have a look at the video to see what that's about. This NADOC week, we are excited to celebrate and honour our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander elders. We went out to our children and young people, asking them what they love about their elders. My elders have taught me what's right from wrong and have passed on the knowledge from their elders from what they got taught as a little kid. My elders have taught me how to play my position in football. My elders taught me how to dance and um, trust in the world. My elders have taught me strength and power. My elders have taught me how precious family is. My elders have taught me to have respect for others and have taught me how important my culture is. I love 
my elders because they love me so much and they take good care of me and I love them because they take good care of my pets. teach me good things. I love my elders because they teach me Torres Strait language. I love my elders because they make me laugh and they have endless stories. I love my elders because they can cook, they're cheeky, and I can learn a lot from them just by listening to their childhood stories. Oh, and um, I love my um, elders because they tell funny stories. I love my elders because they keep the family up and going no matter how difficult it is. My elders encourage me to care for country. My elders encourage me to dance by always showing up for my performances. They encourage me to clean, um, massage their feet, look after my brothers, my sisters, and mom and dad. And they encourage me to sing in church and not be ashamed with my gifts that God has given me. My elders encourage me to love and look after nature. My elders encourage me to keep trying and not to give up on what I love doing. They encourage me to use my music to lift up community. My elders encourage me to be a better person in life. So wonderful. What a give a hand. So amazing. So great, hey. So sweet and um, it's important for us to acknowledge and also to celebrate because as we celebrate people, we also are able to celebrate ourselves as well and the cultures that we bring. Because I just believe that the kingdom of God, when we, when we go to heaven, uh, we're going to see a whole bunch of people from different tribes, tongues, nations, and uh, it's going to be a wonderful party and celebration. So let's get used to the party now. Yeah? Turn to the person next to you and say, let's get used to the party. Yes. That's right. Get used to the party. Let's get used to it. Let's get used to the spontaneity of life. And although the sermon notes are all gone and, you know, I don't have a guy to be able to t tell me where I'm going. Let's just get used to the chaos and just say, God, you are here with us and we're grateful for you. And we're not going to worry. We're not going to stress, but we're going to enjoy the moments of life. How cool is that? How cool is that? In fact, I don't know if you knew... But I, got a, I had a 9mm gun pointed at me. Was it last week, babe? Was it seven days ago? Last week. Okay. And if you don't know what that is, then never mind. But uh, so what happened was there were a bunch of teenagers and there were, um, one of them jumped out in front of my car as I was driving past and pointed the gun at me. And so I looked at him and I thought, okay, this is a bad situation. So I decided... <laughs> as anybody probably would. So I kind of uh, swiped him gently, like an f -pos swipe. Shoop. I swiped him gently with my car and then I continued to drive along peacefully like a good citizen of society. And uh, I saw him and so he, some, he banged the back of my car and he was yelling at me. There was three other guys around and uh, I started to drive off. And as I drove off, I saw a police vehicle going the way over this way in front of me and I high beamed him because it was getting later at night, it was about 5.15pm. I high beamed him and I pulled the police officer o over. Um, put your hand up if you've ever pulled a police officer over. <laughs> I see that, no, 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 there's no hands up. There's one hand. <clears throat> good luck, buddy, good luck. So I pulled him over and I said, oh, officer, um, I think you were speeding. No, I didn't say that. I just said, um, officer, you're going the wrong way. Literally, uh, someone pulled a gun on me um, they seem to have weapons and knives and all that kind of stuff. And uh, if you just want to follow me, I'll just show you where to go. And he goes, no worries. So I go back into um, that dangerous lo location 
and I'm kind of like ducking and weaving, going, oh, oh, like this, and I'm driving straight through, and I see uh, these teenagers, or these young men, there's about 21, 18, 19 year old looking people. And so within two minutes of arriving to that destination, there literally were 22 police officers, 12, vehicle, 12 police cars, six paddy wagons, two helicopters above us within two minutes of arriving. And I said, look, guys, these are the people that you need to arrest. And I don't know if you saw all over the news, but all over the news, Channel 7, Channel 9, Channel 10, there was this incident of... Um, yeah, some pretty violent acts across our city and it was connected to the Fortitude Valley uh, incident as well. So there was um, an incident that happened south of Brisbane and also um, Fortitude Valley and uh, it was all connected together. But I just thought through the whole situation, it's crazy what happens when you, um, when you want to serve God. It's crazy. Because what happened just before that incident was Lucy um, met a gentleman or a gentleman approached Lucy at the dog park in our local area and said, look, I, I'm really in a bad way. And uh, Lucy rushed home and said to me, look, this man, he might even take his life. He's in a very bad way emotionally. So I drove to the... Um, I was a bit reluctant at first. I'm like, what's going on? Who is he? Like, what's his name? I have no idea who he is, but he's in a bad way. So I drove to the dog park and uh, I met him there. And he told me all these bad things that happened to him in his life. He told me about what happened with his um, partner, uh, what happened with his uh, children, absolute betrayal after betrayal after betrayal after betrayal and heartache after heartache. And I said, look, do you mind if we pray together? And so we prayed at the dog park and then I said, would you like to uh, accept Jesus into your heart? Because you just said that, you know, you believe in God now. And he said, yeah. So I actually uh, had the opportunity to lead him um, to Jesus at the dog park while all these people are walking their dogs, which is, yeah, come on, give God a hand for that. That's really cool. <clears throat> but then after a great victory and great glory is a nine millimeter gun. And it's just like crazy in life we have these ups. Oh, you know, mountaintop moments, then we have down valley moments. And I don't know what it's been like for you in the last three years, but I can guarantee you you've had some downs. I can guarantee you've had a few ups, although some of us might not even feel like we've had some ups. We feel like most of them have been downs. But I'm here to declare a message. As we continue the sermon series, Thy Kingdom Come, I'm here to declare a message that a faith that perseveres will get you through every obstacle in your life. So everything that you're going to face, everything that you have faced, every obstacle in the way, there is a secret to overcome that, and that's having a faith that perseveres. So a slide will come up with that, with that title. But I, I just wonder what it's been like over the last few years. Even statistics show us that during the time of COVID in the U.S., that depression and anxiety quadrupled alone because of the isolation, because people were detached from their community. And it showed us one thing, that people were desperate to walk away from communities, whether it was churches or whether it was family or whether it was safe environments. And what happened as a result of, of feeling desperate of leaving their community was an absolute breakdown in the mental health department of their life. And so we realise now how important it is to gather together as a community more than ever before. And the, the way that we can move forward together isn't just through a social hoo-ha and party, but the way we're able to support one another, the greatest thing that we can do for each other is to pray for one another. Dr. Caroline Leaf says this, she's the author of switch on your brain. She says, it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. That's neuroplasticity. That's the ability that God has to change your physical makeup of your brain through prayer. There's a lot of research coming out. An article in CNN writes, large majorities of Americans generally and U.S. Christians specifically who pray daily have turned to prayer during the outbreak of COVID. But so did some people, but, but so did some who seldom or never pray. 
and people who didn't belong to any religion have started praying. More than 55% of adults began praying during COVID. So all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of crisis that turns up and people turn to God again. But it's funny how we use God sometimes as a vending machine. Whenever something bad happens, we find ourselves in church again and God is like, I'm here for you always. Health and Fitness Revolution, which is a leading health and fitness magazine that is not Christian, that's secular, says this. Prayer gives people a better sense of self-worth. Prayer is good for the heart. It increases longevity. It increases positive thoughts. It reduces depression. It relieves stress. It increases a sense of hope. It gives people a clearer mind. It fast-tracks emotional and physical recovery. It prevents sickness and disease. Prayer answers many problems. That's a secular newspaper. That's, that's amazing, right? But we all go through stuff. But we all need to go through it together. Because if you're going to go through something... I want to know how I can help you and how I can pray for you. We as a community aren't here to do life alone. We're actually here to support one another. So I want you to know that you've got people that you can talk to. You've got people that you can pray with. You've got people that will genuinely, gen genuinely care for you. That's what I love most about City Chapel. We don't think we're anything special. We're just normal human beings that genuinely love God and genuinely care for people. We're authentic people. We really are. We gen genuinely love prayer. We love reading the Bible. And we, we don't think anything high of ourselves. We, we, we don't think that we're just amazing. We're just regular people that love God and love others. But the Bible promises us many things in regards to success, crisis, mountains, valleys. It promises us many things. It promises us something in John chapter 16, verse 33. It says this, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. The Bible is saying here that there will be trouble. Now, I wish that the Bible always said, you know what, Tao? There's going to be provision. There's going to be success. There's going to be amazing things that you will always experience. It will just be perfect. Everything will be perfect. Everything's going to be great, Tao. Buckle your seat. You're in for an adventure, and it's always going to go positively for you. I wish the Bible said that, but the Bible doesn't. I wish they took this scripture out of the Bible, the, the middle part of it, because it promises that there will be trouble. And when we go through trouble, it feels like sometimes we're the only ones going through it. And no one else knows what we're going through. But the Bible says here that we will all go through trouble. But then it goes on to say, take heart, for I have overcome the world. So what is Jesus saying? Don't worry, because all these things that you're going through, you're not the only one that's ever gone through them. And I've helped several other people that have gone through the exact same thing. And I know the solution. I've got the answer. And the answer is in me. The answer is in prayer. And I may not change the situation straight away, but I can change your heart in the process, which will make you a better person. You'll become a person that is more joyful. You'll, have a, you'll be a person that has more peace. You'll be a person that has perseverance in the storm. You'll see the storm differently now. I'll change the way you perceive things to be. God is the God of the storm. In fact, if you look at any storm, any major storm, any little storm, the, the scientific fact about every storm is that in the center of a storm, it is called the eye of a storm, a scientific phrase called the eye of a storm. And in the eye of a storm, in the center of every storm, there is absolute peace and there is absolute calm. And so that really depicts your life, you and I, that when we go through a storm, we don't necessarily need to be a part of the storm. All we need to do is go through the storm because God gives us the peace that we need to overcome whatever is in the storm. And so God enables us and empowers us to get through the storm. So I don't know what you're facing right now. I don't know the challenges that you have gone through. I don't know the difficulty. It might be financial. It might be relationally. It might be loneliness. It might be a lack of purpose. The Bible says without a vision, the people perish. So if you don't have hope in the future then it almost feels like we're slowly dying on the inside. It's important to have 
purpose. What is the purpose of our lives? It might be depression or anxiety. It might be something to do with a situation that you haven't shared with anybody. Or it might be an addiction. It might be a struggle with some form of addiction or a struggle, an internal struggle. It might be the fact that you hate yourself and you can't settle the fact that you are a child of God. Whatever it is, God is saying, I have overcome that already and I will help you to overcome that. So buckle in, get ready for an adventure. I mean, I, um, I don't know if you guys knew, but before I became Christian, I've, I felt I've always had a pretty good heart in a way. Like I've always had um, values that I wanted to help people. But there was a period of my personal life where a lot of my friends, um, all of a sudden they were criminals. And I was like, oh, that's not good. Um, that's crazy. And so I had some of my other friends reach out and go, oh, I can see that your life is going this way. That's not good. And then I got in trouble, you know, with police and so forth. And I'm like, oh, that's not good. And then all of a sudden, um, yeah, I mean, my brother's here right now. Um, shout out to Daichi. I love you, bro. I respect you. And you are amazing. Always been inspired by you. But I remember a time in my life where you were even saying, mate, that's not good. You could... I may not be able to see you for a long time um, because of things that you've done through the law system. And so, you know, a lot of us have been down a path that isn't godly, but I found myself going down a very dark path very quickly in my life and I was getting involved with certain things that were pretty bad. And so I hadn't, hadn't had an encounter with God up until uh, uh, at that point. But it was when I encountered God in a room similar to this with the songs similar to what we were playing today with the people like uh, Pastor Latai that gets up just so full of grace. Isn't Pastor Latai amazing? Isn't she awesome? Come on, why don't we give it God a hand for her? She's amazing. Her and Pastor Clark are some of the most caring, loving people in the world. Trust me. Trust me. And so my life was going downhill, but getting involved in, in, in a community that cared for me, that wanted the best for me, that spoke life over me, that said, ah, cut off these things and start to follow the truth, I started to get really serious about those decisions. And um, my life has just fully turned around from, from where I was. But what I ended up doing was, because of all my experiences, I, I got a phone call from the police as I was... Um, in my mid-twenties, I believe, or late-twenties, and they said, oh, I've just checked up a bit of the stuff on your history tale. And I'm like, oh, no. I'm a pastor at that stage, and I'm, I feel like I'm doing better, you know, Lord, I'm serving you. Um, please save me from anything from my past. Um, and I, I said to the police officer, I'm sorry, like, how much do I owe you? <laughs> He's just like, get me out of this, you know what I'm saying? Like, come on, man, don't judge me. I'm a Christian now. I'm a pastor, please help me. And so they said, um, we want you to be in prison. And I'm like, what? They said, oh, no, 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 like um, as a prison chaplain. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> okay, oh, I can do that. I, I, I'll go to prison, no worries, that's fine. But on those conditions, not on the first one, on the second one. Yeah, 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 on the second one. I'm like, the way you worded that was really... Next time you call someone up and say, we want you to go to prison, just word it differently. <laughs> Just, just say it differently. Just save the stress, right? And so I say to this person, yeah, yeah, and there's this person that's going into prison and he's one of the greatest uh, underground outlaws in Australia. He's all over the news and we want you to work on with him. I'm like, oh, okay, tell me about his history. Blah, 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 blah. And so I find myself in maximum security in the prison as a prison chaplain and someone just like, bumps into my arm and I'm like, I'm like, what is going on? And the old Teo started to rise up. You know what I mean, Sion there? Like the, what man? <laughs> what are you doing? Like, don't, don't punch me, you know what I'm saying? Um, and so I had to quickly repent to the Lord and say, sorry God, I, I, I didn't mean that. I don't want to punch him in the face. I don't want to tackle him to the ground and hurt him. I, I love him with the love of the Lord. But don't do that again, okay bro? And they're like, oh, as a prison chaplain, Tay, you've just got to be a bit more gentle with people. You can't do those, you know, these ones. But anyway, he bumps me on the shoulder and I say, look, what's going on, mate? Is, there, is, is it okay? 
And he said to me, I heard your sermon the other day, Pastor Taylor. You come in here, you talk about your story or whatever, or, or how God helped you. You don't know our life. You don't know what we've been through. You don't know the people that we've hung around with. You don't know the rooms that I've been in and what I've done in those rooms. You don't know what I've done to people. You don't know my past. You don't know my story. You don't know my history. So how can you, this clean-cut, cookie-cut Christian pastor, come into the prison and tell me what to do? And I just thought, well, did you want to sit down and talk about it? And he goes, yes. And then I just started to share my story with him. And I realised that some of the crisis that I've been through, some of the pain that I've, I've gone through, it was the pain that led me to hanging around these circles. It was, the, it was the trauma that I experienced that I didn't tell anybody. You know, the things that I went through as a person that I didn't have the courage to share with people around me, that I so didn't value my own life. And so the reason why I didn't value my own life was because I used to look at myself in the mirror and just really despise the person that I was looking at. And so that led me to a whole bunch of crisis and self-inflicted crisis too. I, I'm responsible for the majority of the things that I've been involved with and I take full responsibility for that. But I was thinking about the trouble, the trauma, the crisis that I've been through in my past and I, I just actually just told him a lot of stuff and some of the stuff I hadn't shared with other people. And I found myself talking to this gentleman and it, by the time I'm finished, he's crying his eyes out. And I'm like, are you all right, bro? One minute you're punching me on the shoulder, the next minute you're weeping. Do you need a tissue? Are you, are you okay, mate? Yeah, I thought you were tough. Oh, yeah, criminal. Oh, yeah, King's Cross. Oh, rah, rah, rah. Mate, are you okay, mate? Do you want me to pat you on the back? Are you okay? He's just weeping, bawling his eyes out, saying, Teo, that's exactly what I'm going through. And, and I need to, to know this God who, who loves me. Does he really love me? Does he really forgive us? Do, is there a... Is there a, is there a is there forgiveness? Because that's my issue. I feel so angry towards myself. How, how do I find this God you're talking about? And so this message resonates with people in prison like wildfire. We went from 1% Christians in the prison to 16% in the prison within a year and a half. Within a year, these people are coming to Christ, left, right, and center. You know why? Because they're going through crisis. My message is, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, but Lord, I just pray that I would receive your kingdom now. And what I'm saying is that you don't have to wait till crisis comes. You don't have to wait till life gets bad, until your life spirals downwards. You can receive God's kingdom now. And all the bad things that you've been through, what they are, isn't your enemy. What I realized in maximum security that day is that it was my best friend. The trials, the trouble, the pressure, the heartache, it actually helped me. It elevated me. My pain gave me a platform to preach to this man. So the experiences that we have give us the influence to speak into other people's lives. So if you've ever been through pain in your life, then you are empowered to speak into people's hearts. People will become vulnerable and you will get credibility from your vulnerability. And so don't be ashamed if you've made a mistake, but give those mistakes to God and let God use them for his good and for his glory. But I used to not like the pressure because I used to think that, okay, I've been through some crisis and trauma before I was a Christian. Now I'm a Christian. I go to church and I, I sing the songs. I know the words to the songs now. I'm getting used to it all. I'm starting to volunteer. I'm welcoming people at the door. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a holy, I'm a righteous person, doing great in life. And then all of a sudden, I find that crisis knocks on the door again. And I'm like, mate, I thought we've been through this. I thought that once I give my life to Jesus, everything is rosy and everything's perfect. But I find that crisis knocks on my door again. And I was having a massive day of whinging and complaining. And I, I don't know if you know those uh, action water pump guns that you have. I'm in the backyard of my house in Canberra having a whinging day with God. 
And it sometimes feels good to have a day where you just moan and groan. It does, doesn't it? It feels good to feel sorry for yourself sometimes and complain. And sometimes if the marriage with Lucy and myself was going too good, I just like to throw a spanner in the woodworks and just put some colour into it, you know what I mean? If it's going too good for a long period, I just, I just like to put some drama in there. So we'll have a conversation for breakfast and I'll be like, Lucy! She'll be like, what? I'll be like... The Nutri-Grain. She goes, what about it? I said, there's too much sugar in it. She's like, shut up, Taylor. <laughs> just throw some spanners in there, you know, just for some colour. I'm in for an adventure. You know what I mean? I want some colour in that thing. It's good. But I was having a very big whingy day in my backyard and I, was, I had an action pump water gun in my hand and I was pumping away. And then I started pumping and applying more pressure to the gun. And as I was pumping the gun, I see, see my son Samuel. And he's walking towards the pool. And I've got every intention to shoot Samuel in the head with his gun. Every intention. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> so he's walking past, walking towards the pool. And I expect as I'm praying to God, as I'm whinging and complaining to God, that God's going to say, Teo, put down the gun. Turn to the person next to you and say, put down the gun. Put down the gun. Put down the gun. Put it down. But the Holy Spirit says to me, I feel a whisper in my heart. He says, apply more pressure to the gun. And I'm like, what does that mean? And I don't hear the voice of God like every day. I'm not like super spiritual people like Libby over here, um, who, you know, she prays and she gets whipped away to a third heaven and she's like, woo, out here, looking down upon us, all of us in the world, on the earth today. But I'm not like that. I only hear... God's voice is, is like a peace in my heart, you know, like most, most of us here. And so I just feel this peace in my heart. And he says, apply more pressure to the gun. So I'm applying a lot more pressure to the gun. And then God says, apply a lot more pressure on the gun. So as this water canister, it's like a tank, is having more pressure applied to it. It is like growing. This plastic thing is growing. It's, the p- plastic is bubbling out and stretching out. There's so much pressure on this thing. And then the Holy Spirit says, point it over your roof and point it over your neighbor's roof. And so I point it over my roof and over my neighbor's roof. And then he says, shoot it, Tao. And so I shoot the gun. It goes over my roof. It goes over my next door neighbor's roof. It goes halfway down the block. And he said, see, The more pressure that I've allowed you to go through is the further that I can take you, Teo. The more pressure that I've allowed on your life is the more influence that you have, is the further that you can go. So don't sit there and complain about your problems and have a pity party all day. But thank me for what I'm doing inside of you and thank me that you haven't ended up dead somewhere washed away. That you have breath in your lungs, that you have blood flowing through your veins, that you have a a living body that's partially healthy. Be grateful, Taya. And instead of pointing my finger at the person that did this and the person that did that and the person that falsely accused me of this and the person that said this about me, instead of pointing the finger at everyone else and blaming this situation and when I didn't get a promotion in 1998, when I didn't see finances come through, when I prayed for it and I felt that God would said the finances would come through and they didn't instead of being bitter towards the situation and bitter towards God and upset with everything in the world I decided to take responsibility and to realize the pressure wasn't my enemy but the pressure was my greatest friend come on people give God a hand for that because I'm telling you pressure is your greatest friend I was like God that's not enough I need more convincing. I'm a stubborn guy. He goes, all right, Ty. I said, no, no, no. It's not all right. But why did I have to go through that? He said, well, what? Why did I have to go through, remember God? You and I know that. Why did I have to go through that? So you've gone through the fire. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I've been through the fire. And I just felt the love of God wash over me, you know, and, and I felt that he knew what I had been through and he understood what I had gone through. And instead of blaming God for that and, and being upset with God for 
the situation that happened or being upset with God because things didn't turn out the way I wanted it to, or the pain that, and, the, and the trauma that it caused, instead of um, being angry at God, um, I thought about what he said about the fire. I've been through the fire. You know, because all of us need to, at some stage, unfortunately, go through some form of fire. Um, if you look at the scriptures, even Jesus did. Jesus went through the fire. The first thing that the Holy Spirit did when Jesus was baptised and he was ordained into ministry, he was initiated into his ministry on earth, the first thing the Holy Spirit did was lead him to the wilderness. You experienced the fire. Because if you haven't been through fire, you can't produce a flame when you minister to people. If you haven't been through the, through the fire, there's no depth of richness to your life. I tell you, if you don't go through the fire, there is no ministering and maximum security. You can't look at those people dead in the eye and tell them that God loves them until you've been through that. But God, what is the fire producing in me? How is it helping me? In Job chapter 23, it says, When he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. No tests, no gold. No pressure, no diamonds. See, the issue with human existence is the issue with you, the issue with me is that when we've been through the fire, we think that there is no more value on us and that we still smell of smoke. That's the issue. We go through disgusting or horrible experiences and we go through them feeling like people see us in that way and we devalue ourselves, we, we demoralise ourselves, we think that even God doesn't view us the way we... He, he actually views us. We think that there is no beautiful value on our life. But who knows that the Bible says that his thoughts are as numerous as the sands in the ocean. His good thoughts towards you. If you think about how many grains of sand are in the ocean, think about all the good thoughts that he's thinking about you, there is no space for anger. There is no space for judgment and condemnation. There's only space for goodness. So when he looks at you, he sees his son or he sees his daughter and there is nothing he wouldn't do for you. Let me tell you, there is nothing that God the Father wouldn't do. He will protect you. He will be like a T-Rex and, and he'll rip the enemy off from you. There is nothing that God the Father wouldn't do for you. And I'm telling you that when we go through the fire, it's because God is refining us. He's refining our very lives. You are gold in the making. Just because you've gone through the fire doesn't mean there's any less value on your life. In fact, if you put a $20 note, if you put it through a, a garbage can for three weeks and I pull that same $20 note out of that garbage can that stinks of vomit, do you think it's lost its value? No, just because it's been through the rubbish, just be, because it's been through the muck, it doesn't lose its value one bit. And that's the same with you, my friend. Just because you've gone through things, just because you've found yourself in places, just because you've found yourself making mistakes, it doesn't mean there's any value taken from you. The same value that was on you as a pure, innocent baby is still with you now. I mean, God sees you as someone that is so valuable that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ. He sent him on to earth. He sent him down here in the mess and the chaos and crisis to endure the most brutal punishment known to human existence, being crucified on a cross. Why? Because God values you. So you can't tell me that God doesn't value you. You can't tell me that value has been diminished on your life. That is a lie from the pit of hell. There is so much value on you. Just because you've gone through the fire, it doesn't mean that you are useless. It means that you are gold in the making. Let's give God a hand for that. There is value on your life. There is worth. There is potential. God's got a purpose for you. He's got great things in front of you because you are valuable. You are valuable. In fact, what happens with, I don't know if you've heard of a smelter. A smelter is this thing where they put gold in it and they crank the heat up over 1,600 degrees. They crank it up and up and up. 
And what it does is it takes all the impurities out of the gold. It takes all the, the, the limitations from the gold, anything that was limiting the purity of that gold, anything that was spoiling the gold, anything that was trying to devalue that gold. It was taking all of that out. And I'm telling you, as you go through the fire, all those impurities seem to be washed away. As you go through the fire, there is somebody else in the fire with you, and his name is Jesus Christ. All the limitations are taken away. All the things that you thought were going to devalue you are taken away. Why? Because you've gone through the fire. So don't see the fire as something negative. See it as your friend. You are gold in the making. Is this all right? Your pain is creating you a platform for your purpose. For your purpose. Now, I don't know about you, but whether your relationships look really good right now, whether they've been rocky, whether you've gone through pain in your relationships. I know that I have on a personal level, but have you? Have you gone through a season when you felt misunderstood? Have you gone through a season when you felt that nobody could see you or see your pain? Or see your heartache, I'm telling you, God is getting ready to set you up. Those people that feel isolated, that feel left out, that feel misunderstood, welcome to King David's world. David as a young boy was left to the side. His father Jesse didn't even consider him one of his sons. And so when the prophet came, Samuel came to ask Jesse for his son because he was going to anoint one of his sons to become king of Israel. He didn't even call David to be part of that choosing flock. He just said, no, nah, David, no, nah, just leave him in the paddocks to be with the sheep. I'm telling you if you, misunder- if you feel misunderstood, if you feel left on the sideline, I'm telling you God is getting ready to set you up. He's getting ready to pour oil onto your head. And Samuel poured the anointing oil on David's head and anointed him to become king of Israel. I'm telling you there is a royal calling on your life. You think that your life is washed away, that you're insignificant, that you're a nobody. I'm here to tell you that he has called you to be a king or a queen in the the kingdom of God. He's given you a royal priesthood. He's given you a royal lifeline. What he's given you is he's allowed through Jesus Christ on the cross, he has raised you up and now you can walk in the palaces of God with all confidence. Why? Because you are a part of a royal family. Jesus is the king. He is King Jesus, and now you are part of royalty. Now I see all this stuff that's happening in um, in England with the royal family and the transition to King, you know, to a new king, and and all this kerfuffle about it. But I'm telling you, you know, when they're walking around in the streets, there's they got their head up. They're not like this. I'm telling you, when you understand Jesus is your King and you're part of His family, you don't walk around with your head down anymore. You don't. Just because you've been through the fire, just because you've experienced pressure and just because you've gone through problems, it doesn't mean you're less valuable. You're actually royalty. So let me encourage you with that. Some of you need to pick up your crown again. Some of you have dropped dropped the crown, that crown of royalty. And maybe somewhere along the way something happened and you've left the crown on the table. But God is saying, pick that crown up again and have that confidence that I want you to have. It's time for some of you to pick up your crown again and have that confidence in your heart and to walk as a family member in the household of his kingdom. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Some of us need to pick up our crown. I'm going to ask the worship team to come up as we wrap up. You know, there are, there's a parable about the, the farmer and the seeds that are sown. You'll find that in Matthew chapter 13, verse 3 to 9. Jesus is sharing parables about the kingdom of God. People are asking him, what is the kingdom of God like? What is the kingdom of God? And Jesus answers with this parable. He says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, 
which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced a crop. A hundred, sixty, thirty times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And I find that when we go through seasons of life, when we go through rocky seasons of life, that is an opportunity, a perfect opportunity for the enemy to say, hey, you can walk away from God now. Hey, you can walk away from his purposes over your life. Whenever we go through a transition season in our personal lives where there's pain and there's heartache, the enemy opens up a door to say, hey, now is your time to escape. And I feel like God is saying that he is requiring another level of commitment from his people, not just to be seeds that are sown and that just dissipate. You come to church and we enjoy the worship and then what happens? We walk away from God. But God has called us to be a people with faith that perseveres. They don't just trust in God when everything good is working out in our life, but to trust in God in the midst of the storm. That when there's a rocky situation, when there's a crisis that's taking place in our life, that is the perfect time to get on our knees and say, Jesus, we need you more than ever before. Let's not be that seed that gets eaten up by the birds. Where there's media that's sending out waves and signals of negativity about our life and, and how we should fear the future and how you know, there's so much media out there that is anti-God, anti-purity, anti-holiness, anti-Jesus Christ. And we've got to avoid this media and not let this media infiltrate our system and start to believe the message of the world. We need to start to believe in the Word of God again and what the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives and trusting in the purpose that He's got in front of us. We need to be people that don't get shaken by these experiences in our personal life. And what about the, the, the seeds that spring up quickly, but because the sun comes out, it scorches us. That's talking about the fire. That's talking about seasons of pain and hurt. That's talking about an option to leave and walk away from God. But there's another group of people I want to talk to, and that's the people that have never encountered the love of God. Where you've never really felt the love of God in your life. This is... Something that is so important because if you've never experienced the love of God, if you've never had an epiphany or a revelation of his goodness and love over your life, it's time to have an encounter with God through his love. And I want to give an opportunity for everybody to experience that today because it's that which keeps us into place. It's a relationship with God that keeps us firm in his path, the path that he has for us the future that he has for us. It's encountering God. It's intimacy with God. It's a relationship with him that he's looking for. Don't let any message, don't let any enemy try to take you out, try to choke you out. It is time to persevere through the fire and know that the fire isn't our enemy, but it is our greatest friend, that we are gold in the making, that the fire was sent to harm us, but whatever the enemy meant for harm, God intended it for good in our life. Amen? God intended those things for good in our life. And we're going to embrace God in the crisis situations and know, just like Paul the Apostle knew, I say it again, praise the Lord. I say it again, give thanks to God. And he was in prison and he was telling everyone to thank God in prison. That just sounds crazy to me. That a person in prison is telling everybody that they're free in Christ. To praise the Lord and to thank God for all the good things that he's doing. I'm telling you, it's going to give you an attitude of gratitude. We need to position ourselves in a posture of praise once again. It's that attitude and mindset that says, God, thank you for my life. I'm so grateful and I'm an appreciative of what you have done for me. And help me to move forward beyond this crisis and beyond this trouble. But thank you that you've never left me. Thank you that you are with me. Thank you that you are for me. And whoever is, if you are for me, then who can come again? Against me, Lord. Thank you, Lord God, that you back me, Lord God. When I move forward in life, Lord God, and the enemy pops up its head and knocks on my door, that you back me, Lord God. When the enemy comes in like a flood, God, you raise us a, a standard up against him, Father God. Thank you that you are for us and not against us, Lord God, that you love us. It's crazy that I don't I don't know if you've heard this story about. Um, my father, he went to be with the Lord earlier than I think he should have. You know, 
and there was uh, things that were going on in his world. And um, I remember going to the hospital and holding him in my arms. And I could tell that he was dying, that they were wiring all these tubes to his body. And I didn't know my father as well as I would like to have. I think I would have definitely have liked to have known him a bit more, like, you know, what he was thinking and what he was feeling. But a lot of Japanese men just bottle things up, and so you never really know where they're at. But I, I remember holding him in my arms, and he said this phrase to me. I'll never forget it. He said, um, Teo, no matter what you do, follow Jesus. He said that a day before he died. It's crazy how he had this radical encounter with the love of God on his deathbed. And people say, oh no, it's too late now. I'll never encounter the love of God. I've, I've done too many wrong things or I've lived a certain way. God doesn't have time for me anymore. I'm telling you, a person a day before he dies encounters the love of God in such a radical way. He said to me that I saw a man in a white robe at the top of a staircase and he was saying, come to me, come to me. Teo, I'm telling you, Jesus loves you. And you wonder why I'm here today? You wonder why I'm leading a church today? You wonder why I was in maximum security for almost five years, preaching the gospel every week? You wonder why? I'm it's very simple. It's not, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to believe this stuff. If this guy can have an encounter with God, and believe you me, he wasn't a perfect guy. He definitely loved his alcohol. I mean, if, per, if a person like that can encounter God like that, have a vision of Jesus Christ, tell his son a day before he dies to follow Jesus and don't do anything else but pursue God, well, guess what I'm going to do? And I'm giving an opportunity for everyone now to get serious about your faith. Don't be that seed that gets excited for two weeks, goes to church and goes, oh, yeah, yeah. Don't be a seed that goes, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, I've been hurt by church before and now I'm, I'm over church now and I, I'm over God. Don't, don't be that seed because God is looking for more. He's looking for people that are, have a heart to forgive, have a heart to open up to His purposes and His plans. Don't be a seed that gets excited one day and then turns your back on God the next day. Be a seed that is fruitful, that multiplies, that has influence, that encourages. God's got a plan for you to impact many, 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 many people and do things, crazy things. I've travelled all across Australia and beyond preaching the Gospel. The Gospel has taken me beyond my wildest imaginations, beyond my wildest dreams. I've fulfilled so many of my bucket list things. Why? Because I just want to follow God. God knows your needs. He knows your heart's desires. He will take you on the most radical, enjoyable, adventurous, uh, fun life that you could ever possibly dream of. It would be wild, but it would be so exciting. But if you would commit to His plans. Come on, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you, Lord God, that you are for us, not against us. Thank you, Lord God, that you've got a purpose and a plan over our future. We look to you, Lord Jesus. And for those who are in the room right now that you feel like a seed that maybe you were scattered along the path and the birds came up to eat it. Or maybe you fell on rocky places where there was not much soil. There wasn't much depth to your relationship with God. So what happened? You sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. You withered and you were scorched under the heat of the sun. Maybe you're a seed that fell among the thorns which grew up and choked the plants. Maybe there's negative relationships that are around you. Maybe people are, are telling you that God isn't the answer. Maybe you can find healing through something else. Maybe the Holy Spirit isn't the answer for your life. Maybe there's something else. Or maybe you're a seed that just gave up. You gave up, you gave in when there was difficult weather. There was a crisis situation. Don't be those seeds, but be a seed that produces a harvest 100, 60, 30 times. Multiply yourself in the kingdom of God. See, God is asking for more, but He wants you to encounter His presence and the love of Jesus. Father God, I just so thank you, Lord God, that no matter what we're going through right now, that you are with us. No matter what heartache we're going through, the pain, the crisis, the heartache, thank you, Father God, that you never abandon us. Thank you that it's your will that we are here right now, sitting in the seat that we're sitting in. Thank you for your healing. I pray that people would encounter the love of God right now where they're sitting. 
that people would encounter the love of God. It's your love, Lord God, that breaks the yoke. It is your love, Lord God, that breaks past hurts and pains. It is your love that heals us deeply on the inside, Lord God. So we just receive your love right now. The pain that we've gone through, we let it go and we give it to you, God. We ask you to heal us and that the people that we're angry at, the unforgiveness, Lord God, we lay that unforgiveness down, Lord God, and we choose to forgive in Jesus' Name. Thank you. If you want to make a decision, just like I did, to follow Jesus, just like that person in Maximum Security did, just like that person at the dog park did, if you want to make a decision to follow Jesus and to make a serious commitment about your future, while all eyes are closed, I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I'm going to ask you to slip up your hand. One, God loves you. Two, He's got a purpose and plan for you. Three, why don't you just slip up your hand right now? Yep, so good. You're saying, God, I want to get serious with you. I want to take my faith seriously now. I want to go the next. I want to go the next, Lord God. Thank you, God. I just pray over every person, Lord God. Pray for your blessing upon them. Thank you for them, God. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for the purposes that are on their life. Full potential, a crown on their head, courage in their hearts. I thank you for them in Jesus' Name. Come on, let's give God a hand. A faith that perseveres.